From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. And now here is our host and producer, Hilda Labrada Gore. Hey, Hilda here. When you hear about fascia, what comes to mind? A lot of us think of the common ailment of plantar fasciitis, but there is so much more to this connective tissue. It would behoove us to do a deeper dive. This is episode 493, and our guest today is Alicia Celeste. Alicia is the founder of the School for Living Science and the Kinetics Academy and host of the Human Freedom Project podcast. Today, Alicia helps us understand the connective tissue that is fascia. She goes over what it is, how to keep it supple and springy, and why it matters. She explains common misconceptions related to fascia. She points to how compression and shearing of fascia, for example, helps create structured water in the body, which is so healing. But mostly, Alicia reminds us that we need to explore who we are and what we need as citizen scientists. Before we get into the conversation, I want to invite you to the Wise Traditions Conference in Orlando, Florida, this October the 25th to the 27th, we're excited to announce that Sophia Nguyen Eng will be one of the speakers at the conference. Sophia is known as Sprinkle with Soil on Instagram, and Sophia is also the author of the Nourishing Asian Kitchen Cookbook. Come out to the conference, hear Sophia speak on the topic of nourishing Asian cuisine reimagined, a journey to reclaim authentic flavors free from MSG and excitotoxins. Go to wisetraditions.org to find out more about Sophia's talk and our whole lineup of speakers and opportunities. Save your spot today, and we look forward to seeing you there. This is Hilda Labrada Gore, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Alicia, welcome to Wise Traditions. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Listen, fascia is having a moment right now. I feel like it's totally trending. People are talking about this connective tissue. And years ago, there wasn't a word about it. Why do you suppose that is? Well, there were a few people talking about it. The most <laughs> famous is Ida Rolf. Most people have heard of Rolfing or structural integration. I mean, she was kind of one of the first people to make it somewhat famous, but it was definitely not super popular. And of course, now we have social media and we have the internet, and YouTube. I think fascia is getting out there. But if I had to guess, I think what's happening right now in the zeitgeist of the internet and the wellness space is... What's actually having a moment is quantum biology and fascia it has a relationship to that. So I think people are super interested in structured water, water and memory, and how those things might interact with the body. And fascia plays a role in that, at least if you have a certain education around fascia or you've dug into certain rabbit holes. That would be my guess. And then it's kind of gone through a few phases. So I was first introduced to the world of fascia in 2008. And back then, I would have told you like, no one's heard of it because I would ask most of my clients when they would come see me, have you heard of fascia? Like, that's what we're going to be working with. And almost everybody said no. And so I got to educate them. Well, this is what it is. And and now everybody's like, yeah, it's kind of that stuff that wraps your muscles. And but everybody's heard of it by now. And it's interesting because people have heard of different parts of fascia. And so they might tell me various things. Let's back up a little bit. We will get to the structured water piece later. I want to start with the basics right now. Tell us what fascia is and its role in the body as you understand it. Yeah, and this is definitely my understanding. Maybe just as a quick caveat, the way that I like to learn and then teach, I'm on YouTube and I teach courses on this stuff. The way that I like to learn is directly from the source. I'd prefer to learn about fascia from the body, from fascia itself, than from a book or cadaver dissection class or anything like that, even though you might say maybe that's from the source. But a cadaver is a dead body and fascia is mostly fluid. And we know this from cutting open living bodies. We're not going to learn some of the most important things about fascia if we study cadavers. I've been stepping on people to do a form of fascia release that I developed into a whole methodology since 2008. And that's like working directly into the fascia. So I've had like a front row seat to all kinds of textures and from brittle and and crunchy and dehydrated and knotted up (laughs) to supple and soft and fluid over the years. I like learning directly from fascia. I'm going to share from that perspective rather than the other. I'll interweave them a little bit because I think what we learn from that kind of science can corroborate what we learn from fascia directly. Fascia is the most abundant tissue we have in the body. 
this is like literally the spiel I would give every client. <laughs> uh, it wraps up every nerve ending and then every muscle fibril and then every muscle fiber. Every fiber of muscle is actually multiple fibrils. It wraps the muscle bundle and the muscle group. It wraps our bones and our organs. It's really meant to be flexible and elastic and fluid and able to move with us through life. And it performs a variety of functions, actually. But my favorite is that it's the connector and separator of the body and the communication highway. There is no communication that happens in the body that doesn't pass through the fascia. For example, if your liver wants to talk to your brain, it has to do that through the fascia. If one muscle wants to talk to another, it has to do that through the fascia. Fascia is the communication highway. It intercepts messages coming to us from the environment as well, such as temperature or maybe even chemicals or toxins coming into the body that enter through the skin. And we have the lymph system housed just under our skin, which is basically like encased in a sheath of fascia. And then mm -hmm. under that is the deep fascia. Fascia is getting all of these messages and messengers all the time from chemicals and water molecules to light, magnetism, sound, vibrations, and it's passing all that information through the body 24-7. It's the best place to look, in my opinion, for gathering data about a particular body. So if someone's in pain or someone has some kind of health issue going on, fascia is actually the best place to look to intercept those messages. So that's how I like to think about it. <laughs> Okay, so you said it has a role as a communicator, and that's really helpful. It's interpreting yeah. what's coming in and even what's going on inside the body. What was the other role you mentioned? I missed that. Well, I wouldn't say that it's interpreting anything. It's just passing information. Okay. I would actually say that fascia is the most objective element in our body, whereas the nervous system, for example, is highly subjective. If the nervous system intercepts a message coming through the fascia, and sends that to our brain and we process it, that's going to be a very subjective interpretation because we might interpret it through our own meanings and stories and beliefs rather than what's objectively true. And that's what one of the things I think that makes the, the body and the human being so interesting because we're all going to interpret these things differently. The other, I think I said it, it's a connector and a separator. Mm -hmm. That was the other element. There is no other element in the body that touches any other element. Only fascia touches every element because it wraps everything and then it separates it. And I find that really fascinating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like no, there is no other, there is no two elements in the body that touch each other. They can only communicate to each other through fascia. That is fascinating. Absolutely. And I think you're right. I think the general public is waking up to fascia in our lives, mostly because people are in pain. And yeah. I think when they think of fascia, the most frequently used phrase I've heard related to fascia is plantar fasciitis. Talk to us a little bit about what tightens up the fascia and what makes it painful in different parts of the body. It's, I've spent my life trying to answer this question. I don't have a short answer for you because actually pain is really complex, but it's the most fascinating topic to me. Fascia is the most fascinating element in the body, but pain is actually the most mysterious and interesting phenomena, I think, that occurs in human beings. I was just talking to someone the other day and saying, because I teach what I do to practitioners who would like to maybe work with people in pain through this method of fascia release that I teach. And one of the misconceptions about fascia release, for example, and I'm, I'll tie this back to plantar fasciitis because I have a YouTube channel and I talk a lot about various pains that we might experience that we can use fascia release to address plantar fasciitis being one of them. In fact, I put out a video in 2015, I think, thinking nobody would ever see it. It was the very first video I ever put on YouTube and it went viral. <laughs> <laughs> it has like 800,000 views by now, but it's about plantar fasciitis. So I know a lot about and I've worked with a lot of people with plantar fasciitis, but pain is very interesting. So I was saying to my friend the other day that in many ways, it would be easier to work with people who have cancer because it's actually measurable. Like we can image it. We can do an MRI or an x-ray mm -hmm. or an ultrasound or some other kind of test and actually find tumors in the body. But if you think about it, pain is, we can't locate it. You can't locate pain. You can't find it. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. unimageable and it's highly subjective. We can circle back around to that if you want and go into like the pain domain, pain science. I find it fascinating. But as far as fascia is concerned, we really need to be like I was talking about earlier, flexible and elastic and fluid. 
And the reason plantar fasciitis is so common these days, I think, is that we're actually getting bombarded in a whole bunch of ways that dehydrate our fascia. Electromagnetism being one of them, EMFs, sitting more than normal and then getting out of the chair and doing maybe like intense exercises instead of kind of gradual or like we used to walk all day long or garden. And one of fascia's roles is to absorb mechanical stress. One of the things I really like to talk about with fascia to give people an understanding of what it's constantly doing for us, it's really engaging with the five kinetic energies of our planet, which might sound a little woo, but it's extremely scientific. So we've got mechanical energy. And so if you want to run or hike or go for a walk, you need mechanical energy. Mm -hmm. You actually need it just to stand up. (laughs) Right. And so I'm standing for this podcast. And so my feet are touching the ground. And the ground is is unmovable, hopefully, because <laughs> I'm in the house. <laughs> so hopefully the floor under me isn't just going to collapse, right? Which one of us, the floor or me, is going to absorb that energy? It's me. My body's going to absorb not only my kinetic energy going into the floor, the floor will give it back to me constantly. Boom, boom. It'll bounce back into my body. What fascia is really supposed to do for us in a healthy scenario, if we were really healthy, is take that mechanical stress or energy coming into the body. So mechanical stress, you could think about it like me standing here, or if I really didn't like you, Hilda, and I decide I'm going to punch you. <laughs> Uh-oh. I love you. I'll never punch you. But if you are ever struck or hit or in a car accident or you fall, those are types of mechanical stress. Mm-hmm. So what that means is it's mechanical energy that's causing an impact that could be harmful. Fascia is supposed to absorb that mechanical stress and distribute it through our entire body, that we don't get injured at the place of impact. Interesting. And then there are four more kinetic energies on the planet, right? What are those? Yes. Well, let's circle back around to those in just a minute. So we're, because I want to answer a question about plantar fasciitis and pain. If you can't absorb mechanical stress, you're going to feel stressed, aka pain, or potentially have damage occur in the area of impact. You're going to feel it in your feet if your body can't absorb mechanical stress and you're on your feet a lot. But the solution is you're not suffering from a lack of hokas or cortisone injections or shoe inserts or things like that. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Orthotic support. None of that stuff is what we're missing. No, we're not. We're missing water. Water is the key to fascist ability to absorb mechanical stress. And so the visual I really love to give people is if you imagine throwing a rock in a pond, it's going to hit the water, right? And so there's an initial impact, but then it'll form these ripples, these waves that travel all the way from the center of where it hit to the edges. They get gradually more subtle and gentle, but that's how our body would distribute mechanical stress in the same exact way. So it's the water that distributes mechanical stress. So if your tissue, your fascia has become dehydrated and brittle, You could think about it like throwing a rock in a mud puddle. It's going to go splat and it's going to cause a hole, right? There will be an indentation. It'll cause damage to the mud because there's not enough water there to distribute the mechanical stress. And if you think about it, water is the most indestructible element on this planet. (laughs) You can't damage it. You cannot damage it. I hadn't thought about it before, but yes, it just, it kind of rolls with the punches, literally. Yes, it'll turn into steam and then evaporate, but then it'll eventually come back down. It'll just move somewhere else if you disturb it. It'll go flush down the drain. It'll freeze, you know, and then unfreeze. And But you can't destroy it. You can't get rid of it. You can only move it and transform it. The other kinetic energies are light. And we actually are photosynthesis machines. We actually photosynthesize. (laughs) Yes. And magnetism or electromagnetism. And then sound vibration, which is probably the least understood and we don't talk about it very much. And then thermal energy, heat and cold. I'm writing these down. Yeah. Wow. Fascia is responsible for managing those energies in the body? Yes. And so if you think about, I believe, this is my personal opinion, I believe that there are physical spiritual laws underpinning reality and we can know them. And the same laws that apply to a tree apply to us, but maybe there are different rules that apply to us in addition to trees because we're not trees. These five kinetic energies behave very much the same way in us as in nature, like that visual I just gave you of throwing a rock in a pond. 
water behaves very much the same in us as it does in the planet. We have rivers, we have lakes, we have estuaries, right? And then it leaves our body like flowing into the ocean. These other kinetic energies are also coming in and leaving the bodies. We absorb them, we can transmit them, which means to communicate them. And then we can transfer them and then transform them. So those are the options and they're happening whether we want them to or not. So you know how we're always talking about people who have good vibes. Mm-hmm. You're right. You just feel it. It's an energy. It's like, I feel you. <laughs> people who have bad vibes, you know, but it's an energy and we're giving it off. That's a transmission. And I believe that that's actually happening largely through that fascial system, which scientists are starting to explore it a bit now, although it's still pretty fringe. But they're really looking at it like a giant sensing organ. Like we can sense our environment with it. Like I think it's through the fascia that we actually sense if you're walking down the street and the hairs on the back of your neck stand up and you look behind you and you get a bad vibe. Then you get that intuition or instinct to walk a little faster. That's neuroscience can't explain it. Nervous system science can't explain that. Something else is, is transmitting or receiving a transmission and we intercept it consciously. Maybe this is why I've heard you refer to the fascia as something of a knowledge field. And I've heard other people talk about it being the place where the soul resides. And I'm trying to literally wrap my mind around these concepts, but if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying is there is something not just physical, but maybe spiritual and emotional and something that can't be quantifiable by scientists related to the fascial tissue in our bodies. Yeah, some of it's quantifiable, some of it's visually apparent, some of it we can look at in living bodies if we cut them open, and then of course in cadavers. But I've heard Zach Bush use the term the knowledge field. I like using that just because to me it makes sense that there's knowledge getting transmitted all the time, right, out there. The trees have knowledge I don't have, but maybe I could actually know what the trees know. Coming up, Alicia points out the importance of bioindividuality and why fascial release, as most of us understand it, may not work the same on every single person. You're listening to the Wise Traditions podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Optimal Carnivore. Organ meats are some of the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet, and our ancestors prized organ meats for their vital properties. Brain Nourish is a revolutionary new product from Optimal Carnivore that combines grass-fed beef brain and lion's mane mushrooms in a groundbreaking formula. It is the ultimate whole food nootropic to build a better brain. Studies have shown that both ingredients are remarkable at improving cognition and brain health in the short and the long term. And each serving of these Optimal Carnivore products has 1,500 milligrams of organic lion's mane mushrooms and 1,500 milligrams of beef brain. And by the way, it's only 100% real mushrooms, organic fruiting bodies, which are rigorously tested for active compounds. So go to amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and use the code WESTIN10 to receive 10% off brain nourish or grass-fed liver, grass-fed organ complex, and other products from Optimal Carnivore. Again, that's amazon.com slash optimal carnivore and the code Weston10 to get 10% off anything you purchase. And Paleo Valley, if you're interested in lowering inflammation, improving blood flow, and relieving joint discomfort, consider Paleo Valley's turmeric complex. Nearly every benefit of turmeric is rooted in the fact that it is one of the most potent natural ways to encourage a healthy inflammation response in the body. It inhibits the inflammatory factor. And there are lots of ailments rooted in or exacerbated by inflammation. Enter Paleo Valley's Turmeric Complex. It's combined turmeric with coconut oil and black pepper, which has been shown to help improve turmeric absorption by 2,000%. In the complex, there is also organic ginger, rosemary, and cloves, which have additional benefits like brain support, promoting a healthy inflammation response, immune support, and healthy digestion and blood sugar levels. Head over to paleovalley.com slash wise to get 15% off your first order of their turmeric complex or any of their other products. Again, that's paleovalley.com slash wise to get 15% off your first order. This is Huddle of Radagore and you're listening to Wise Traditions. I was about to ask you for some simple exercises that we could do to keep our fascia supple and young and springy. I've heard of skipping, for example, but 
that's not the only tactic to take with this tissue, is it? No, in fact, I mean, I would really encourage everybody when thinking about our bodies and pain and health issues. Like I'm on a mission to share a couple messages primarily. I call myself a pain advocate actually, but I believe we need to start treating individuals instead of symptoms and labels because one person might come to me with lower back pain that's on the right side and it's an eight out of 10 and someone else might come to me with right-sided lower back pain, that's an eight out of 10, but they need completely different things to resolve it. If I start thinking like, oh my God, this amazing thing I found that works for me, everybody should do it and it's gonna work in exactly the same way, we'll miss the mark. We won't quite get it. This is why people end up feeling stuck or they feel, because a lot of the time these things do work. Like people try fascia release and they get out of pain and then they think everyone should do it. But then there are the people who don't get the result or people who try Wim Hof method or ice baths. And maybe it actually makes their autoimmune condition worse, but they don't know why. And they feel a little like, wow, there's all these people with these amazing testimonials. Like, why am I the one who's not getting a result? I love to use practices that give us the data we need first about our body. You know, we were talking about these five kinetic energies and you can measure them through fascia release, but you could also do it with cold plunging. Like you could, instead of doing, say, a cold plunge or a cold shower, simply to get the health benefits you've been told are possible, I recommend that people first do it to learn about themselves. Because, for example, let me give you like a concrete example about why this is important. Hilda, do you have anything that scares you? Yes, I would say so. (laughs) Even (laughs) though I like to be bold and unafraid, there are things that scare me now and then, yes. Can you name one just that you don't mind sharing? I live in a city and I increasingly encounter people who are mentally unwell and it's threatening. Have you noticed anything in your body when you're in an experience where you're witnessing that or it's starting, you don't feel safe? Like Absolutely. Well, I know what my body and mind do. My mind thinks, how I can take them down if I need to. (laughs) It's self-defense, but I literally think of how I could kick them or do different things. And I'm like, well, that doesn't seem very loving and friendly. And I go around most of my life, Alicia, wanting to be shine, light and love. But in these moments, I'm like at the ready. Yeah. Do you notice anything with heat? Do you get hot? Do you get cold? Oh, I think I get hot. What you just described is you fear triggers fight and you need heat to fight. Your muscles need blood. They need, if you're going to like go into action, right? But I'm wondering if you would agree with me that you could put somebody else in that scenario, maybe me, I don't know, and they would get cold and they would go into freeze mode, maybe. Oh, yes. I could picture that. Yeah. Understanding how as unique individuals, we react to certain stimuli, such as something that scares us or fascia release or a cold plunge, or the sauna is really important because some people don't need heat. They need something else. And other people need heat because maybe they go so into freeze all the time. I'm a big fan of like, let's do some investigating first for to see what you as an individual need, instead of thinking like this fascia release thing is going to be what heals you or helps you because some people might end up in worse pain. Some people might not get out of pain at all. I'm often recommending that people not do what they see people doing on social media or the top podcasters are doing just because they're doing it. Because by the way, often these are, I will say, speaking from a woman's point of view, they're men, they're at a different age and stage. Obviously, they're probably a different ethnic background. I'm me and they're them. And if I tried to do exactly what they did, like if I replicated, let's just say, Andrew Huberman's diet, it wouldn't necessarily work for me because I'm a completely different person. So I think this is along the lines of what you're saying about- exactly our relationship to the fascia and what's needed. Yeah, I guess I'm just taking it maybe a step further, which is like, yes, we're all different. And we can come up with very strategic processes to know what we need. Instead of just like, well, I don't know, let me just experiment for five to 10 years (laughs) and not know what I'm doing. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I love. I love I'm a scientist. I'm not trained. I believe everyone can be a scientist. And I don't necessarily think that the science being conducted in, you know, our institutions is necessarily that scientific. Are you the Um, one that coined the phrase citizen scientist? Well, I don't think I coined it, but I use it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. Let's go back to some of your own learning experiences, Alicia, on your own body and fascia. Tell me about your own 
healing experience. I think it was like in 2011 or so. What happened? Yeah. To tell you what happened that summer, we'll have to rewind a little bit further. But the short story, it is a long story. I'll make it short today. But the short story is I went through some pretty traumatic things as a child and a teenager and ended up not feeling emotions from age 10 to 24. I didn't really realize it until about age 18 when a boyfriend broke up with me because he said, I can't feel you. Like you're very unemotional. You don't feel anything. And he was crying, breaking up with me. And I was like, it's totally fine. It doesn't matter. And he was like, see, you don't feel anything. (laughs) That was my wake up call. Like he's right. Oh my God. Like I am not feeling and this doesn't, I don't know why I'm not feeling anything. But what I was feeling was intense, debilitating daily chronic pain. I had gut pain that started when I was 14. It was really bad and made me want to be very antisocial and just stay home. But I had systemic soft tissue pain, pretty much head to toe. I don't go to doctors though. And I grew up not going to doctors. (laughs) I've never gotten a diagnosis and I don't really believe in them anyway. But if I had gone, I probably would have been diagnosed with something like fibromyalgia or myofascial pain syndrome and all been given some drugs or whatever to manage it. But I had chronic daily pain. And then I had this knee pain that started when I was 17 that eventually stopped me from running and then stopped me from hiking. And that was another big wake up call because I love those things more than anything. I love being outside. I live in Colorado these days. And then in 2008, I was in massage school and one of my instructors introduced us to this method of fascial stretching that involves stepping on people. And he said, who here wants to be stepped on? And my hand shot in the air faster than I could even think. And I put my calf up on the chair and he stepped on my calf. And the moment his weight sunk into my calf, I had this, just this knowing came over me. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to hike and run again. I'm going to feel at peace in my body. I'm going to feel free and I'm going to heal. And it's only in hindsight that I can even tell you why I knew that at the time, but It's related to what I just shared about not feeling anything for so long. I started feeling again when I was 24. I started journaling and that was actually the most helpful thing for me because I tried therapy and it didn't talk therapy. It didn't really work for me. Mm -hmm. No judgments. I know some people really benefit. just didn't do anything for me. I tried a whole bunch of other things. God, every diet you could possibly imagine. (laughs) And not to like, not diet to lose weight, but like elimination diets, gallbladder flushes, like drinking the olive oil, I tried it to try to heal my gut. None of that worked. But then this knowing came over me and I'm like, there's something about this fascia thing. But like, it's going to heal me. It's the key to my freedom. And I would love to tell you it was just an overnight success, but that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to enroll my instructors, the founder of that modality, Richard Rossiter. I don't mind sharing. I'm really grateful I had this whole experience. I learned this modality called Rossiter. It's a pin and stretch method initially. And no one could help me run and hike again. They couldn't tell me why I was in pain, which was really frustrating. It was like, but the reason I'm sharing this is is I think that this really set me up for to help people in a way that I wasn't able to get help. So I wanted to give people what I never got. um, And I wanted answers first. I actually wanted answers more than anything. Mm. And I just figured if you can't tell me why I'm in pain, how can you help me? Even though they were just working with this fascist stuff, they didn't know a whole lot about pain. And so I set out to learn everything I could about pain. And then in 2011, I moved to Colorado with my best friend, Jess. And I grew up with her. We'd known each other since about seventh grade. And then we kind of reconnected through Facebook in 2007 or eight or something. So we hadn't really like seen each other in a long time, but we decided to move to Colorado together. And we moved into this mountain house and there was a trail right outside my door that went to the top of Mount Sanitas. I think you've maybe hiked that. Have you hiked it? Sounds familiar. Yes. yes. I think you have. I think I've seen it on your Instagram. I just like, there's no way I can live here and not hike and run. I asked Jess, would you learn to step on me and help me run and hike again? And she said, sure, that sounds fun. (laughs) (laughs) And two weeks later, I was hiking and running again. Now that sounds like an overnight success story. And again, it isn't. It was like two and a half years of experimentation. And then this one very important thing happened. And I would love this to be one takeaway for your audience today about fascia because I think there are some misconceptions out there about it. And I've had Mm -hmm. so much experience working directly with this tissue that I can share some examples of what I'm about to say. But what happened between 2008 and 2011 that I believe allowed Jess to help me better 
than my teachers is I accidentally invented, I guess, although I don't really know that I invented anything, but I accidentally discovered what I would lovingly refer to these days as the clunk. (laughs) If you ever do fascia release of any kind, that's the way I teach it anyway. It's a compression and shearing based fascia release method. We are hunting out adhesions. So these are balls of tissue that are stuck in knots. What I learned initially was a pin and stretch method where you would step on people, pin the tissue to the floor, and then coach people through movement to stretch fascia like taffy. And I was hired straight out of massage school by a chiropractor who I did a demo on of stepping on her and it got rid of her hip pain that had been nagging her for like a year and 20 minutes. She forbid me from stepping on people. (laughs) Wait, why? That doesn't make sense. It helped her. Exactly. She didn't want you to use it. She had an insurance-based business in Georgia. This is Georgia, the South seeing people in chronic pain every week. I worked there for a year. I saw the same people every week for a year. They were on insurance seeing me. She had an insurance-based insurance based business. And unfortunately, I think that's true of a lot of, a lot of practitioners these days. They don't necessarily want people getting better because if they do, they don't get that paycheck. Oh, no. But I knew I could help people with this other thing. And so I started doing table Rossiter, (laughs) using my forearm to pin tissue, they'd be fully clothed. And then I'd coach them through some movement. Mm -hmm. I discovered the clunk. So I was like, something just thunked under my arm. And I had asked them like, you felt that right? They're like, yeah, that hurts a lot. But their pain went away like that. I'll never forget the first client this happened with. She was like 72. She had debilitating hip pain. And she'd been coming every week for a while. And I was like, can I just try something on you? It's probably going to hurt a lot, but I think it'll help you. And she's like, I'll try anything. She let me try this on her. I sunk my forearm into her IT band, coached her through some leg movements. We got the clunk. We started shearing it. And within three minutes, she was out of pain and she didn't need to come back. (laughs) Oh my goodness. uh, Now, were you nervous? Were you like, okay, this lady's over 70. I'm going to break something on her. No, I've never (laughs) had that. See, that's a very interesting... I think that's a good question. So a lot of people will ask that. And a lot of people are afraid to hurt people. But I've never been afraid to hurt people with this for some reason. (laughs) I just have this knowing Mm -hmm. that we are not as fragile as we think we are. And I didn't learn this until much later. This is not something I knew back. This would have been 2010. Fascia is as strong as steel. It can withstand up to 2,000 pounds of mechanical force without deforming if it's healthy. It would take a lot to actually truly damage someone. And we're also really good at protecting ourselves. We have that fight or flight instinct where we'll brace against it if it doesn't feel right to us. So when I'm working with people, I'm always paying attention to that. And working with, because that's a nervous system reaction. I call the nervous system the gatekeeper to the world of fascia because one thing about fascia is that it won't change just because we want it to. Interesting. And if you think about it, that's how life is. You don't just get to wave a magic wand and rub a genie bottle and have everything you want. (laughs) There's going to be some work involved and it may be painful as you were suggesting I want to go back to something you said a moment ago. There are many common misconceptions about fascia. Can you clear a few up? And we're actually running a little bit out of time, Alicia, but this is fascinating, or should I say fascinating? Tell us some common misconceptions that people have related to fascia. Yes, because fascia has become so popular right now, maybe you've seen this, but there are like fascia fitness methods coming out. And then people are claiming that yin yoga can help you have healthy fascia. And if you just eat these kinds of foods, it's going to feed your fascia. And those are all what I would call outside in approaches where we project something we've heard or learned in a book or on a YouTube video onto the body. And we think it's going to do something specific. But if you actually think with reality, this is a saying I like to say, think with reality. (laughs) Um, We all know it's not true. Everybody, you can feed someone the same food and they're going to react differently. Some people like it. Some people don't like it. Some people's guts are okay with it. Some people's aren't. And it's for all kinds of different reasons, right? And so the same thing is true with fascia. We have this misconception that you can just release it and it'll release. And that's actually not true. And when I say, so release it, you know, (laughs) or that you could get on a foam roller and it should do you good, but it might not. Or that if you come see me, just because I'm going to step on you, you'll get out of pain. That's not necessarily true. But the other major one has to do with what I just was sharing about compression and shearing. If you just pin and stretch fascia or these yin yogis, I live in Boulder, Colorado. 
And there are tons of yogis here. And I have stepped on a lot of them. And they have the most adhesed fascia of anyone I've ever worked with. You would think Um, it would be the opposite, right? So here's the thing. Fascia will withstand overstretching. It'll resist it by forming knots. We're constantly doing the splits and doing these yoga poses where we're trying to increase flexibility. We may actually cause our fascia to form adhesions in the process. (laughs) So that's just a big misconception. And then the compression and sharing is what creates water. This has to do with, I'm pretty sure you've, you've heard of Gerald Pollack right? Yes, I've interviewed him. Yeah, okay, I really want to get my podcast. But compression and shearing of water molecules creates structured water. This is what's happening when we compress and shear. Fascia is supposed to be mostly water. So when we compress and shear fascia, we create structured water in the body. And that has a profoundly healing effect on us. Uh, It can create that water battery where it's going to move our blood faster, our lymph fluids faster, it's going to usher toxins out, we're going to have good blood circulation. I'm a huge fan of compression and sharing over other forms, like to really get in there into those knotty areas, into the brittle tissues and actually rehydrate them. And some of those other methods just aren't going to do that. Gosh, Alicia, I almost feel like I'm a little bit more confused here toward the end than I was at the beginning (laughs) because you've suggested that while some people would say that stretching is a good idea for your fascia, if you do too much of it, it leads to the adhesion. And if you do, of course, too little movement, if you're sitting a lot or not hydrated, it can lead to some tightening up of the fascia. Is there anything, well, and you've also said that individuals might need, one case may need one kind of treatment and the other might need another, even if the cases seem to be identical or present identical symptoms. Is there anything across the board that you would recommend? Because we're getting toward the end of the podcast and I, as much as the listener, want to know, are there yeah. simple things we can do to keep our fascia hydrated and supple and springy? Yeah. So I wish I had a very easy prescription for you, but I don't. I have one thing I'm going to point to that is, has been a consistent. I've been doing this since 2008. It's just been consistent since that time, which is that people who are in integrity with themselves have the healthiest fascia. I've had a front row seat to people with chronic pain and trauma. And many of these people are in the wrong marriage. And they tell me that they want to be out of their marriage, but they're too scared to leave their partner or talk to them. Some people hate their job and they're too afraid to quit. They just tell me these things as we're working together. But the people who are clearly in the right relationship, they love their life, they're moving their bodies, they have the family life they want, they have the friends they want, they have the healthiest fashion, they get out of pain really fast. Wow, that is so beautiful. And really, this is one reason here on the Wise Traditions podcast, we focus on food, farming, and the healing arts. Of course, the fascia falls into the latter category, but there are so many components to well-being beyond what the eye can see. Absolutely. Or even what the body can feel. Well, think about it related to those kinetic energies because we're transmitting that vibration all the time. And if you're not in integrity with yourself, you're literally in resistance or in internal conflict and that creates tension And so that'll cause tension in your fascia and your fascia will then reflect that. Well, this has been amazing. I'm so thankful that you came on to enlighten us a little bit about this little understood tissue. Apparently we have a lot more to explore. So maybe on a future episode. In the meantime, I want to pose to you the question I love to pose at the end, Alicia. If the listener could just do one thing to improve their health, maybe it would be related to fascia. It might not be though. Tell us what is one thing you would recommend that they do? You know, it's got to be related to this last thing I said, actually. It's look within and examine whether you are living the life you want, if you're in integrity with yourself, if you keep the promises you make to yourself. I think that is the best single thing we could do for ourselves, is to make every choice we make every day, who we're with, who our friends are, how we spend our time, that it's actually intentional and it's in integrity with what our soul and spirit are telling us we should be doing. So that sounds like a wonderful way to live and good questions to pose to ourselves. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been a wonderful conversation, Alicia. Hilda, thank you so much. Yeah, I'll come back anytime if you want me to. Our guest today was Alicia Celeste. Visit her website, aliciacelest.com to learn more. And I am Hilda Labradagor, the host and producer of this podcast for the Weston A. Price Foundation. You can find me at holistichilda.com. And for the transcript for this podcast episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org and click on the podcast page. And now for a recent podcast review from Apple Podcasts. Friendly Lizard said this, my favorite podcast. This is my favorite podcast. 
I really appreciate the program. It has meant a lot to the health of my family and our 17-month-old through his life so far. Friendly Lizard, thank you so much for your friendly review. We appreciate you. And if you would also like to rate and review the show, go to Apple Podcasts, click on the ratings and reviews, give us a bunch of stars, and tell us what the show means to you. And thank you so much for listening, my friend. Stay well, and remember to keep your feet on the ground and your face to the sun. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.